we're talking about long line applications. There's a couple things with long line applications that you don't initially consider. And the main one is, is that the problem with long lines is what? Question mark. I want one of you to answer it. What is the problem with having long lines? What problems does it cause for the equipment? <clears throat> migration of the refrigerant. Why? Why would it cause migration of the refrigerant? Because it usually, well, typically it's because there's a big difference between the height of the air handler and the condenser and long lines also means you have a lot more refrigerant Boom. to move. Full stop. More refrigerant. That's actually the main thing is that there's more refrigerant. But then you also have the potential for pressure drop uh, on the liquid line, but you can also have static regain on the liquid line too, and we'll talk about that. So, but the main factor with long lines is that you have more refrigerant. And when you have more refrigerant, what can that more refrigerant do when the system turns off? Uh, if, if, if no one else wants to, I mean, if Ronnie doesn't want to participate, he's too busy stuffing his face. Yeah, full of hungry howies. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Refrigerant migration. <laughs> refrigerant migration, which means what? It means that the refrigerant will move uh -huh. through Where? the lines and it'll pile up either in the evaporator or in the condenser. It's going to pile up in the condenser. If it piles up in the evaporator... <laughs> it does sometimes. Uh, no, it, 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 it is true. There are certain applications and that can cause a problem when? Why is it a problem if refrigerant piles up in the evaporator? Oil. Okay, so there can be some oil that moves there, but not, not normally. Like, you're not going to have oil that moves out of the compressor during the off cycle. That's not going to happen. But if you get refrigerant that gathers in the evaporator coil, so liquid refrigerant gathers in the evaporator coil, what is, what is the problem there? Why do we care? Uh, yes. It's because if there's liquid refrigerant in the evaporator coil and the compressor starts up, what's going to happen to that liquid refrigerant? Instantly vaporize? It's going to dump down the suction line. It can actually dump down the suction line. Have you ever seen an inverted trap before or a specification that talks about an inverted trap, a trap that actually, rather than going down out of the evaporator coil, actually goes up? Oh, yeah, I have. Seen have you that. seen that before? You especially see uh, that in applications with, um, uh, with refrigeration. So you'll see inverted traps a lot of times in refrigeration. Because in refrigeration, you tend to get more of that effect. Do you know why? Why do you get more refrigerant, liquid refrigerant piling up in the evaporator coil in refrigeration so much cooler because the evaporator coil is in a cold space whether it's on or off yeah. right when we shut off an air conditioner that evaporator coil warms up pretty quick right when we shut off a, a freezer that evaporator coil stays very cold and so in comparison to the outdoor where is liquid refrigerant going to want to condense it's going to refrigerant moves from high pressure to low pressure right where's the lowest pressure going to be at the evaporator coil, right? The coldest point is going to be at the evaporator coil. So that refrigerant is going to condense in the evaporator coil. So that is, that can result in a flooded start. So where you have liquid refrigerant that comes down out of the evaporator coil. So where do we want liquid refrigerant? Or even, we, we say liquid refrigerant because that's the primary mass. That's where most of the density is. Where do we want that refrigerant to be in the system when the system is off? The liquid line or condenser coil. Liquid line or condenser coil, right? That's where we want it. If you have a receiver, it can be in the receiver. But you want it to be somewhere from the discharge line of the compressor all the way to the metering device. That's the safe space for liquid refrigerant. So if you're going to add liquid refrigerant to a system, say you have a system that has no charge in it whatsoever, just pulled a vacuum on it, and you're going to dump liquid refrigerant in the system, where are you going to dump it? Liquid line. Liquid line. You're going to dump it into the high side, right? Why? Because when you start that compressor, it's going to have to make it through that metering device. It's going to have to be expanded and turn to vapor before it makes it back to the compressor. Because the compressor is not a liquid pump, it's a vapor pump, right? It moves vapor. So we only want it to move vapor when it starts up. We only want it to move vapor. Uh, we only want it to have vapor in it when the system is off. And we only want vapor to be entering it when the system is running. So those are kind of three different things, right? Because you could have a situation where the compressor has no liquid in it, but then it starts up, liquid dumps down the suction line, goes into the compressor. That's what we were just talking about. That's where the inverted trap can come in. You can have a case where liquid refrigerant is entering the compressor when the system is running. What is that called? Flooded. Flooded, flooding, right? Zero superheat. 
Zero superheat, that's another name for it, right? Yeah. The liquid is still at saturation in, or the refrigerant is still at saturation in refrigeration, especially in grocery refrigeration, they like to call that wet gas. Your gas is wet, right? I mean, and it is true because it's still, you're making this into a fart joke, aren't you? That's what's happening. I think that, well, that's what happens, right? I mean, if you feed that compressor wet gas too much, you end up having to change his pants. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. 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 Good time. So, we don't want to have liquid refrigerant. Now, it's not when we say liquid refrigerant entering the compressor, we don't mean a full column of liquid. That's not going to happen, right? You're not going to have a full column of liquid. It's still going to be mostly gas. There's going to be a little bit of liquid into it. Some compressors can handle more liquid than others, and it has to do with the, how much is left. Because if that liquid, if there's a tiny bit of liquid refrigerant and it enters that really hot crankcase, in some cases it's gonna flash off before it really causes much damage. But as that liquid begins to saturate that oil more and more, it gets worse and worse, right? We definitely can't get liquid refrigerant into the head of the compressor, the actual compression chamber, whatever type, depending on the type of compressor it is. We don't wanna get it in where it's actually doing compression. Although, with certain uh, scroll compressors, they can actually even deal with a little bit of liquid refrigerant all the way through the head because of that ability to move and flex. So if it didn't have an ability to move and flex, that axial and radial compliance that a scroll has, if you put wet gas into it and it tried to compress it, it would just immediately destroy the compressor. Now, wet gas is going to destroy the compressor either way. Liquid refrigerant entering the compressor is going to destroy it one way or another. It just will be a slow death if it does it, you know, if you have some ability to handle it. When I'm doing this, I'm, I'm doing a scroll. This is a scroll compressor, by the way. You know, yeah. In case you couldn't tell. Literally, I was born with a scroll compressor for hands. It was a, it was a dead burned anomaly. The doctor mentioned it right away. He's like, this boy's gonna be a refrigeration tech. And my mother said, I agree. God bless America. And then a bald eagle flew over. <laughs> Sorry. It just sometimes, sometimes my patriotism just cannot be harnessed. All right. All right. So let's talk about what constitutes a long line. Now, this is specific to a particular model. It's actually, this is the Carrier um, Universal Long Line Guide. If we go up real quick, let's just go up and show you what this guide is. Residential Piping and Long Line Guidelines. So it's pretty much for all of their ACs, heat pumps, all that. We're going to go over the specific guide for the condenser that we have here, just to show you that as well. But this is pretty much universal. AC with pure and refrigerant long line description. Beyond these lengths, a TXV is required. So that's the start. Total length, TXV required beyond 50 foot. Outdoor unit above or below indoor unit, TXV required beyond 20 feet. So this is an interesting thing because we've been getting shipped systems with pistons in them for this entire time. And has anyone ever thought about the fact of, well, if the outdoor unit is above or below the indoor unit, either one, which is interesting, no, no, no specific distance listed, just above or below it. So that's pretty much every one. Um, if it's beyond 20 feet, a TXV is required. Now, why does a TXV, why would a TXV be required with long line? Now, in this case, I mean, I wouldn't even call that long line, over 20 feet. Why would it be required? What does a TXV do to help this problem? Anybody know? When pressure is equalized, the TXV will close down. Okay. True. What do they call that? What's the term that at least Carrier uses for it? Hard shut off. Hard shut off. HSO. Right? <laughs> Another term for it is non-bleed. So you can describe it a couple different ways. So you have a bleed valve. You have a non-bleed valve, also known as a hard shut off. Or you could call the bleed valve a non-hard shutoff. AO, so many names. But what it's, the reason why the TXV hard shuts off is just simply how TXVs work. You have this balance of forces, and so when the system begins to equalize and that suction pressure starts to rise, your external equalizer is the closing force of the valve. That closing force quickly increases and overcomes the opening force. So the valve goes shut. Now, that valve isn't necessarily going to be like perfectly shut. Uh, because you're relying on the seat in the valve and they can bleed a little bit. So you may get a little bit of bleed. But in terms of your normal cycle times in a system, you are going to prevent massive amounts of liquid. Are you, is it going to not equalize at all? 
Have you ever taken a, I mean, of course you have. You shut off a TXV system. Does Do the pressures equalize? They do. Yeah, they do, right? So it's not that they don't equalize. It's that it's not allowing a lot of refrigerant to move. And it's because it's going to, it actually won't even shut off until they get near equalization. That's how that valve works. But it's going to prevent that slow migration of liquid out of the condenser and liquid line where we want it because that's where it is when the system's running. The majority of our refrigerant when the system's running is in the liquid line and the condenser, right? Because it's liquid, liquid is more dense, it's heavier, so there's more of it in the condenser and the liquid line. So when that system shuts off, that first little bit allows it to equalize, but after that, it's gonna prevent that slow motion of liquid refrigerant going through the evaporator coil and then entering the compressor, because that's where we don't want it. Actually, we don't want it evaporator coil, suction line, or compressor. Another side note, what's the reason why we don't like burying suction lines for a long distance? Why wouldn't you want to bury a suction line for a long distance? Is this a, like a side side note? No, it's it's directly uh, related to what we're talking about right now. Hmm. What temperature is the ground in comparison with the air for most of the cooling season? Colder. It's colder, right? And when the system goes off, what is the lowest point in the system now if you have a buried suction line? The suction. The suction line, right? And what is the coldest part of the system now if you have a buried suction line? The suction. The suction line. So where is liquid refrigerant going to condense? The condenser? That's what it's for. <laughs> <laughs> when the system is off, it's going to condense in the suction line. So what's going to happen when it's off for a while and then it comes back on? Liquid is going to be sucked into that compressor, right? Push. Right. So we don't, we, we do it all the time. I mean, I get these, it's just like people complaining about flex and why we bury, and bury line sets is the same thing. Why do you do that in Florida? You know, it's just because, okay? Stop asking us all these questions all the time, all right? <laughs> you know? It's the same reason everything happens in Florida the way it does. It just is how it is, okay? We have a special exemption from the government to be how we are. <laughs> Uh, so it's not a good practice, is the point. We really shouldn't be burying suction lines if we can help it. And if you are going to bury suction lines, what are some things you can do in order to prevent this problem? Well, I'm about to tell you. <laughs> That's what's about to happen, all right? Woo! If you don't know, I'm about to dad burn tell you. Now let's go to the next one on the line on the list. AC with pure and refrigerant long line description. Beyond these lengths, long line accessories are required. If you have a quarter inch Liquid line plus a TXV. You guys following me here right now? Do you see this here up, up here on this dead burn screen? Are you serious? Yeah. Well, you're just sitting in a dumb place. That's why. Go. All right. All right. Whoa. <laughs> wow. What is that there? <laughs> you guys are being very difficult. All right. Quarter inch plus a TXV. Now, how often do we use quarter inch line sets? I mean, uh, liquid lines. Not very. And Almost that's because it's not allowed, right? We're not allowed to use quarter inch liquid lines, are we? We are allowed. We are allowed, actually. We just never do. Why? Because we don't pay attention to the specs. Okay. And so it's easier for us, well, two reasons. We don't pay attention to the specs, and it would be annoying to have to stock quarter-inch liquid lines. But actually, if we can, if we have a short enough line length, and it, depending on the, it depends on the tonnage, too, of the system. Some allow it, some don't. You have to look at the specific product data for the system you're using. We can reduce the need for some of these long line um, uh, accessories by using a smaller liquid line. So you can see, if we have a quarter inch liquid line with a TXV and the units are on the same level, it doesn't matter how long it is within the acceptable, allowable length that no accessories are needed. Outdoor below indoor, no accessories needed. Outdoor above indoor, now above 175, then you need accessories. So this chart here is just telling you when you do and do not need accessories. And so it's not just a single number, right? This is the point. So for our typical applications, 3 8 liquid line and a TXV is going to be standard. If the units are on the same level, 80 feet and longer is going to be considered a long line. If the outdoor is below the indoor, 35 feet. If the outdoor is above the indoor, 80 feet. Now why? Why is it worse? when the outdoor is below the indoor? Why is the problem more pronounced when the outdoor is below the indoor? Because then uh, you would have refrigerant 
coming down the lines into the compressor. Correct. There's going to so you have that gravity force that's going to drive more liquid into the compressor, right? So here's the point, though. Actually, I, I, and and I didn't even I didn't even read it right. So 80 feet if it's on the same level, 35 if the separation is vertical, or 80 feet total length, and then 80 feet. So in some cases, it's going to be as low as 35 and as much as 80, somewhere in there. But you know there's lots of systems that have longer than even 80 feet. Think about Vista K. It's a good example. I just named a name. Ooh, ooh, the subdivision, right? A lot of those units are long line applications. Did they look at that and pay attention to, do we need additional accessories? No. 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 For heat pump systems, the chart below is when the application is considered long line. So in heat pumps, it's even worse. Now we only have 20 feet. And this is going to be very typical outdoor being below indoor. That's going to be very typical in residential applications. You look at equivalent lengths too, because if you have fittings, fittings add some equivalent length as well. So if you have a 3 8 or sorry, a 3 quarter inch 90, that's equal to uh, 1.5, 1.8 feet as an example. Now, again, we're getting a little bit pedantic here. We're just going to start with the things that are actually going to help you first pay attention and notice, do you need long line um, accessories? This is, we talked about this recently, the refrigerant charge adjustments. We did a different video on that. So we're going to move on from that additional charge that has to be added. And so let's go, this is just showing you your maximum total equivalent length that's allowable. So that's what those that's what those equivalents with the fittings and all that are. One thing that's interesting to notice, for example, is that if you look at um, let's look at a two ton unit here. If you have a two ton unit and you have a quarter inch liquid line, you have a shorter total equivalent length that you can have it be. So you couldn't use a quarter inch liquid line on a two ton system with the outdoor unit below the indoor unit vertical separation for greater than 75 feet, even in the best of circumstances. So you see here, up here with this, with this row are the separations. This is the ver vertical separation, and then these are our total equivalent lengths. One thing you're gonna notice pretty quickly is that when your condenser is above your air handler, you can get away with a lot because you get what's called static regain. So if you have a system you could have a, uh, we'll go here, we could have a two and a half ton system with a 5 16th liquid line. We're just going to use 5 16 because obviously with quarter inch you can only go 30 feet. You can go up to 250 feet all the way across the board. Why is that? Why are your allowable line lengths? So again, we're not talking about what qualifies as long, line length or not. We're talking about allowable line lengths. Why are your allowable line lengths so much greater when your condenser is above your air handler? I think it's because you're not as likely to push liquid all the way to the compressor because um, you have to go uphill for so long. The gravity would help you. No, because this is actually a different question. So when it comes to allowable line lengths, when it comes to allowable line lengths, we're really not talking about this whole liquid return issue to the compressor. We're actually looking at pressure drop on the liquid line. So all of this is about pressure drop on the liquid line. If you get too far and your liquid line is too small, for example, you can get too much pressure drop. But when your condenser is above your air handler, as that liquid falls, you get static regain. So the pressure down at the bottom near the air handler is actually higher than the liquid pressure at the condenser. And the longer the line is, the more that static, re more static regain there is. So longer lines don't cause a greater problem in that circumstance. Now, you could have long enough lines that you could have return gas temperatures coming back to your compressor that could be too high, but that's all a question of suction line insulation. So you could theoretically just keep adding more insulation to your suction line in order to keep your suction gas cool enough by the time it returned, right? You're not gonna get significant pressure drop across your suction line because it's such a, you know, suction gas is so light. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So that this is all about maximum total equivalent length. This isn't about whether or not it qualifies for the long line length um, for long line uh, accessories or not. We, we did that in the first chart. That's why they're separate charts. You have your maximum total length. This is how far you can possibly have it based on the size. And then you have the one that we already looked at, which is about do we need accessories or not? All right, so now 
let's go into and again it's it's you know you two stage single stage you know different different applications um but let's go down into the accessories now because this is what we're really going to talk about today so this is actually the uh product data for this specific unit that we're going to be installing this on so we've got our crankcase heater kit our factory crankcase heater kit we have our factory hard start kit and we have our factory solenoid kit, liquid line solenoid kit. And so we're gonna look at which one of these would we need. And just for the sake of making it simple, we're gonna pretend that we have 100 feet of level. So they're, the air handler and condenser are essentially level and they're 100 feet from each other. So let's first see, does that qualify as long line? We're gonna actually look at the, look at the guide here. So again, here it talks about maximum equivalent length and ma maximum total length. Do we need a long line? If it's above 80, we do. Okay, so we're 100 feet, so we're at the point that we need to follow the long line application guidelines. So now we're gonna go into what do we need? So this gives us all the different, all the different accessories, but here's gonna tell us do we need them or not. So first thing, this isn't accessory usage guidelines for long line applications, it's all accessories. So it gives us a couple different columns. One of them is required for low ambient cooling applications below 55 degrees. What does that mean? What is a low ambient cooling application below 55 degrees? So in the winter, you may still have be getting a cool call. Like if you're a commercial building, yep. you have a lot of internal generated heat. Yep. And you have to be trying to run your system when it's 30 degrees outside. Right. So if you're trying to run the system when it's cold outside, which you have to do in a lot of applications. Uh, server rooms are a really good example of that. We'll run into that from time to time. Um, even, even some people will try to run it in a, like a, a media room where there's a lot of internal heat generated and they may want it all year long. If, it, if you're trying to run air conditioning when it's below 55 degrees on this equipment, then you have to have these accessories. And so these are the things that you need to have. Well, the accumulator is standard. You need a ball bearing fan motor. You need a compressor start assist, you need a crankcase heater, you need an evaporator freeze thermostat, you need a hard shut off TXV, isolation relay, you don't need a liquid line solenoid valve, motor master, and support feed are recommended. Now let's go to what we're talking about required for long line applications. Over here it's for Seacoast applications, but long line. Accumulator, standard on this unit. So we're talking about a specific unit so they know it's standard because it's a heat pump, it comes with an accumulator. Why does an accumulator help in long line applications? It has the ability to collect a lot of liquid before it hits your compressor. It collects liquid before it hits the compressor, right? So that makes sense. And especially during that start. So if you had, uh, say, wet gas dumping down that suction line for any reason and it made it into the accumulator, that accumulator, within reason, is going to prevent it from making it into the compressor, right? So that's good. So that's the first one. Ball bearing fan motor? No, we don't need that because that's for the motor master control. That's for ramping down the condenser fan speed. We don't care about that. That's a low ambient condition thing. Compressor start assist capacitor and relay. Why would we want a compressor start assist capacitor and relay in a long line application? It's going to need a little more power if we're doing this. You need more power, power, wonder working power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But oh, why? More refrigerant to move. So more refrigerant to move? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, that, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Right. You have a lot more that you're pushing against when you're trying to start. So they suggest now, again, we could talk for three days about what a compressor start assist capacitor and relay actually does. But what it comes down to is, is it applies more current to the start winding and applies more force during start. That's, that's really what it does. Um, it does not reduce start amps. So I'll just say that quickly because a lot of people have that misunderstanding. We put it on cases in cases where the lights are dimming because it reduces the time that it takes to start, but it does not actually decrease start amps. It actually applies more current to the start winding and the run winding current remains the same that it would have been anyway. So it's actually more current, but for a shorter period of time. And so in terms of like violence, it's actually applying more violence to the rotor of that motor. Uh, Eli liked the word violence for some reason. He's really, he's really, he's really, he's really yeah. smiling. That one. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, kind of weird. Get him, start assist. All right, so crankcase heater. Yes, why do we have a crankcase heater? A long line? And a long line application. Why a crankcase heater? 
First off, what's the purpose of a crankcase heater? What does it do? Let's just start with like breaking the name of it down. There you go. It heats the crankcase. But why do we want to heat the crankcase? If there's liquid that is sitting inside the compressor, the heat will help boil it off before startup. Well, it'll prevent it from going there in the first place. It'll prevent it from condensing oh, yeah. in the first place. When does a crankcase heater run? When should it run? When the system is shut off. When the system is shut off. Now, ideally, it would also only run when the compressor has cooled off fully. Right. right? Because initially, after it stopped running, it's not gonna, you're not going to condense liquid in there for a little bit. That's how train has them there. Right. So there's some variation here, and we're going we're gonna to cover that as well. So crankcase heater helps prevent liquid from condensing in the compressor by keeping it warm. That's what it's for. A lot of people have misunderstanding. Oh, it just keeps it warm, so it starts easier. No, no, that's not what it is. It's just, it has a specific purpose, and that's to keep liquid from condensing in it. Evaporator freeze thermostat? Nope, because that has nothing to do with long line. Hard shut off TXV? Yes, that's pretty much across the board, right? Hard shut off TXVs. If you're over, remember what we read in the last guide, like if you're over 30 feet in a lot of cases, you should have a hard shut off TXV. So we already talked about what that does. Isolation relay, no. Liquid line solenoid valve, C long line application guidelines. Interesting, interesting. The liquid line solenoid valve is the one that's sort of like, do we really need it or don't we? Now, I didn't actually prepare for this, so let's see what it says here. Accessory description. A liquid line solenoid valve, is an electrically operated shutoff valve with starts and stops refrigerant liquid flow in response to compressor operation. It is installed at the outer unit to control refrigerant off-cycle migration in the heating mode. Usage guidelines. An LLS is required in all long-line heat pump applications to control refrigerant off-cycle migration in heating mode. See long-line guidelines. So specifically it's saying in this, in this case, if it's a heat pump, it requires it. Now, why don't they say it's required? Because they already know that this is a heat pump based on the guide. I'm not really sure. It says right there all. Do we ever install any of these on anything ever? No. No, pretty much nobody does, right? Uh, I had, it's funny because my friend Josh Berg, some of you know Josh, uh, he built a house in Groveland many, many years ago before I started Kalos. And the guy who installed his AC in his house put one of these in there. And I, it's the first time I'd ever seen one. And he told Josh that it just helped make it run better. But the funny thing was, is he only had about a 10 foot line set <laughs> <laughs> and it was just in a garage. So he just thought it was a cool thing. He probably just went through all the accessories and got all of them. So definitely not a case <laughs> where it helped. Now, some people are used to liquid line solenoids um, in a pump down or pump out application. And in refrigeration, you'll do that a lot. That's actually the way that many refrigeration systems are designed to turn on and off. Uh, in fact, we've done it in air conditioning applications. There was a case where there was never a control wire run to a, to a split system uh, on a grocery store, and it's the only way that it had ever been set up. And it's actually not a terrible way. What it does is, is down at the evaporator coil, the valve closes whenever the system cycles off. So that's all it does. The contactor's powered all the time. The valve closes when it's supposed to cycle off. And what does the unit do when you shut off the liquid line? Pumps down. Pumps down, right? And then you have a low pressure switch that shuts it off once it hits whatever the designated low pressure is. And so at that point, you're cycling the equipment and you're pumping it down each time. If you're pumping it down each time, where's the liquid staying? In the liquid line. In the liquid line and in the condenser, right? Which is where we want it to stay. So it's actually kind of a cool design, but there's a problem with it. What's the problem with it, Bert, with that design? Uh, I would say the strain it puts on your compressor about low pressure. So that is actually one side of it. And that's why you wouldn't want to set your low pressure control very low at all. You don't need to set it very low. You don't need to pump it down to a really low level. You're not trying to open the valves, right? So if you're working on a 410A system, you would just you would just set it, you know, maybe, I don't know, 80 PSI, something like that. I'm just making that up. But you wouldn't need to set it that low at all. So yes, it is a little additional energy. So there's a little bit of energy if you do it right, though. But the problem is your low pressure control. Your low pressure control it needs to be set right and it needs to not fail because if it does, you know, that could be a real problem. And also if the valve starts to leak at all, it's going to sit there and short cycle. Now you can set it up so that it only does it so many times and then it stops doing it, you know, but then you're still going to get some of that if it's off for a long time. So there's some challenges with that, but that's not what this is. So if you've ever heard of a pump down or a pump out system, that's not what this is. 
This is literally just a liquid line solenoid that shuts off the liquid line when the system goes off. And why would we need that on a heat pump, specifically on a carrier system, in heating mode only? Why would it only matter in heating mode and not in cooling mode? Hmm, hmm, interesting, perplexing. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Any thoughts? Yeah. What? What? No TXV in the condenser. Yes, Elijah, very good. No TXV in the condenser. So what does that mean? That means that while you have hard shutoff capability when the system is running in cooling mode, in heating mode, you don't have that. So where's your condenser in heating mode? Inside, right? So when that system cycles off, where's all that refrigerant going to go? which is the compressor, right? You don't have that, you've lost your hard shutoff capability now because now it can just back up through that piston and make it back, right? Make sense? So that's why they have this as, as an option or as part of the long line. Now, is it, you know, am I being pedantic to say that we should do this every time in long line applications? Maybe, but I'm telling you what the manufacturer says for this particular piece of equipment. That's not going to be the same for everyone. Some pieces of equipment have hard shutoffs inside, outside on a heat pump system and even carriers going to that on a lot of systems now. So, you know, may not be something that, that happens for that long moving forward. Um, also, this liquid line, this shut off, hard shut off liquid line valve, sorry, say that again, this liquid line solenoid valve, setup is also going to be better and more reliable than a hard shutoff TXV. A hard shutoff TXV, you know, the, the shutoff ain't that hard necessarily. You know, it's not, it's not really closing that hard. So you still can get some bleed through it. All right. So that is our long line application. And those are your most common long line uh, components. Hard shutoff TXV, accumulator, crankcase heater, Liquid line solenoid valve. What's the last one? I forgot one. Oh, and hard start kit. Now, whenever you're gonna put a hard start kit on a new piece of equipment, I strongly recommend putting in the one that's recommended by the factory versus a universal one. And why is that? Why do I recommend putting in a factory hard start versus a universal hard start? Anybody know? Yes, I don't. Do you know what turns a start capacitor on and off, brings it in and out of the circuit? Current. Nope. It's something called a potential relay. Okay, so you have a potential relay and you have a start capacitor. The size of that start capacitor in microfarads and the, the point at which that potential relay opens and closes, because it starts off closed, Right? The relay starts off closed, so it starts off with a lot of extra capacitance feeding the start winding. And what extra capacitance does, and this is, whenever I talk about this, it's like I get a thousand complaints about it because it's just not something that people talk about a lot, but it is how it works. <clears throat> extra capacitance results in additional current moving in and out of the start winding. So it means the start winding gets more current. Because normally the capacitance of your regular 30, 40, 50, 60 microfarad capacitor limits your run capacitor limits how much current is going in and out the microfarads limits if you check the current on your start winding have you ever noticed what it is you know, if you've done the under load uh test for capacitors you've done this where you take and put your clamp on the start winding w about what is that current on average well uh, let's say like between four and six the point is it's low right? It's low. Why is it low? It's the start winding, right? And, and a lot of people say, well, the start winding comes out of the circuit. No, it doesn't. Not in a PSC motor. In a PSC motor, it's a permanent split capacitor. That start winding is always energized, right? I'm going to guess it's limited by the capacitor. It's limited by the capacitor, by the capacitance, right? If we connected that start winding across the line, the current would be significantly higher in that start winding. So the capacitance limits it. So when we start it up and we give it a lot more capacitance, what happens to the current in the start winding? It increases. The it current. increases the current, right? But what takes that potential relay and opens it? And if it was a current relay, it would be current, but it's not. It's a potential relay. So what do you think activates a potential relay? The 
Potential, potential, it's not potential current, potential, <laughs> that was a joke. It's not potential current, it's potential, right? And potential is what? What's another name for potential? Voltage. Voltage, right? So when a motor is running up to speed, have you ever checked the voltage between um, start and common? Yeah. And is it higher? It's higher. Way higher. It's higher. Why is it way higher? Why is your voltage between, if you go on your run capacitor, between start and common on your run capacitor, or between start and common on your contactor, either way, whichever way you want to do it, it's higher than the applied voltage. Why? I give up. You don't know? Really? Yeah. Oh, I, th I thought you were joking with me. I'm not trying to be a, a snot. I just thought okay. you were joking. Um, it's because your motor produces back EMF. So your motor acts as a generator. A motor is being turned by electricity, creating elect electricity, creating electromagnetic field. But once that motor gets up and spinning, it actually has this responsive magnetic field that produces this additional potential. That's what we call back EMF or counter EMF. Okay, and that's why your voltage is higher. Your voltage isn't higher because your capacitor is a magical voltage increasing machine, because it isn't. A capacitor is literally just a storage device, in and out, in and out, that's all it is, right? Creates a phase shift. Everybody always wants me to say phase shift because that means something to everybody. So the magnetic field of the motor the is actually higher voltage? Or is actually producing. No, no, it's producing higher voltage. It's actually acting as a generator as it's spinning. And because your start winding isn't connected across the line, it's, it's just dead ending in it, into a capacitor, there's actually that stored additional potential is showing up. So... It has to be set up so that way initially those contacts in that potential relay are shut so that way the start capacitor actually does its job and starts, right? But then that's, that difference in voltage between when it started and when the motor got up to full speed has to be enough to open those contacts. Otherwise, if those contacts don't open in that potential relay, what happens to the motor? If this start capacitor, go ahead and grab our grab our start capacitor from our old kitty roo here just in case I see Ronnie about to fall asleep on me I appreciate you being here Ronnie I'm good. you know you just had a baby probably not sleeping a whole lot yeah. how's the baby sleeping not a lot not a lot so that's good I'm very proud of you <laughs> what is the microfarad rating on that capacitor 88 through 108 okay so is that for like a smaller tonnage system yep this would be a small one 108 Yep, so this is, it's specifically for this unit, actually. 108 microfarads, right? So let's say that it starts with a, I don't know, we'll say it has a 30 microfarad capacitor, and I'm not sure what it has. But if this, if the contacts in this relay don't open, and this additional 100 microfarads stays in, and now it's running 130 microfarads all the time, what's going to happen to the current in the start winding? It's going to be really high. It's going to be really high, and it's higher than it's designed for, right? So what's going to happen to the start winding? It's going to fail. It's a funny thing. A lot of people who sell hard start kits tell you that hard start kits help prevent start winding failure. Opposite. Hard start kits that fail cause start winding failure. Full stop. Right? I could take a, under normal circumstances, without a hard start kit and a properly sized run capacitor, a start winding is almost never going to fail. Why? Because it has very low current because that run capacitor limits the amount of current that can go through it. A lot of guys will be, hold on a second, what about start amperage? I know that when a compressor starts, it draws higher amperage, draws higher current. Right, Sam? Compressor start, it draws higher current. But where does it draw higher current? On which winding? The run winding. If you check current on your start winding and you do a startup, it's going to be the same as it was when it, it's going to be the same all the time. You don't get start a, a, a spike in start current on the start winding unless you have a hard start kit. Then you will. Because the hard start kit takes the cap off of that limit of current. Because again, the only amount of current that can go in and out of a start winding if it's not connected across the line from L1 to L2 is dictated by how much capacity and the frequency, but the frequency is fixed, the capacitance of that capacitor. And so... If you have a capacitor that's undersized, what happens to your start winding current? You have really low current. Really low, right? 
What, what is your start winding current if you have a bad capacitor? It's, if I have a bad capacitor? Open capacitors, bloated up, looks like a oh. toad. What's your start winding current? Yeah, Zero. But what's your run winding current? If you measure on common and that thing's trying to start, what is it? Yeah. Real high, right? So it's a misconception to think that compressor start starting causes high current on the start winding. I mean, it's of course, it makes sense. That sounds like that's how it works, but it isn't. Right. So why is it important that start gear is properly matched to the piece of equipment? Well, because this capacitance needs to be properly matched because we don't want it to be higher than it needs to be, you know, just as high as it needs to be and no higher. Higher means more what on the start winding? More current. More current, which means that you can damage the start winding, right? Yeah. What happens if the relay isn't sized appropriately for the potential of that motor when it's starting? So this, so the contacts don't open. What happens to the compressor or the motor? It wouldn't matter as long as you have a big enough capacitor, you're going to have more current. I mean, it's not going to open, so it'll affect the start. Winding. It it will it will burn out the start winding, right? What would happen if this? was sized up so that way it came out too quickly. So the contacts opened too quick, too soon. What would what would that do? That's true. That'd be that'd be a point it's difficult universal. Yeah, it would render the start capacitor less effective. Right? And that's what most universal start kits do. Is because they want to be safe, right? They want to make sure that they're not going to burn up a compressor because they don't want to pay for that even though if you read their marketing or you go to one of their uh, trainings, they're going to tell you that it helps prevent start winding failure. I literally have a PowerPoint presentation from a very large creator of hard start kits that explains how because of all this, and they even show the graphs and charts and everything, they say that these help prevent start winding failure and completely false, right? For example, if you have a compressor that has a completely bad run capacitor and no start capacitor, how likely is it that the start winding is going to fail? It is impossible for the start winding to fail. Why? Because when I say impossible, yeah, somebody could hit it, physically damage it, right? But electrically, it would be impossible for it to fail because there'd be no current going through it. What increases the likelihood of start winding failure? Hard start kit. Increased current. Anything that increases current, right? Oversized run capacitor, oversized start capacitor, relay that doesn't come out soon enough, right? Make sense? So this is why on certain units, and, and Bert named one, you, you put the universal and it doesn't work, then you put the factory one in and it does work. It's because in some cases, it's bringing it out too quickly or the capacitor's undersized. But the, on the opposite side, it may work. Like, oh, hey, this started the compressor. That's great. You walk away, oh, three days later. It must have been going bad anyway because now it's failed. <laughs> you know, it, She was on her last legs and that's why she needed a hard start kit. Right? That's a great line. Your lights were <laughs> the light. You put it on because the lights were dimming. <laughs> you put it on because the lights were dimming. A week later, the compressor has a failed start winding. Well, you see, the lights are dimming because that compressor was on her last legs. She didn't have much life left in her. Right. So if we use, so if we use the train relay with the universal hard start. <laughs> It, it's all about the capacitance. So if the capacitance matches the factory capacitance, you don't need to use a factory kit. Yeah. You could get a potential relay of the right size, and you could get a start capacitor of the right size, put them together, and you've got yourself a hard start kit. That's what a hard start kit is. Now, there are other types of start components, PTCRs. Um, some PTCRs use capacitors, some don't. All of a sudden, my mind went blank about what PTCR stands for, like literally. Positive temperature coefficient resistor, sorry. Positive temperature coefficient resistor. And all of the, all those do is they just allow a temporary connection across the line. They actually allow a lot of current through the start winding. They don't do a phase shift unless they have a capacitor with them. So some have a capacitor, some don't. Yes, Sam? So obviously it's going to vary system to system and size to size. But what's the, what's the time frame that the capacitor is taken out of the circuit after the initial start? Real fast. Real quick. Yeah. No, it's the, the goal is to take it out at right about 70 to 80 percent of full motor speed. Because that's when you have enough back EMF. Correct. To... That's how you size it. So once you're to 70 to 80 percent of full the motor speed. Go off. Exactly. And the universals stay on a little longer? The universals generally don't stay on quite as long. Okay. Now, there's a lot of people who say, oh, you're talking about a two wire. It's a three, if you do a three wire, it's no problem. No, I'm not. I'm not talking. It, it is, it, no, 
It doesn't matter if it's a, the brand that has three wires or the brand that has two wires. They both work on potential. It's just that the brand that has two wires looks at potential between start and run, and the one that has three looks at potential between start and common, which is the more typical way. People say, well, because it's what the manufacturers do, it's better. No, it's not. If it's not the factory capacitor and the factory relay, then, and again, it doesn't matter if it's factory or not. It, it matters whether or not the rating is the same as what the factory had, right? You could look it up if you wanted, but it's a lot of extra rigmarole. Now, I'm not actually, it sounds like I'm hating on universals. I'm not. Universals for the purpose of putting on units that aren't starting as, as they start to age and as there's problems with the equipment, fine. It's not practical to keep a zillion different hard start kits on your truck. So for that purpose, it's fine, but I do not suggest using universals in newer equipment where you have a long line specification that says it's required. Make sense? Yeah. Now, some people will say, well, it doesn't apply to scroll compressors. Is that right? I'm gonna go with no. <laughs> That's a very good point because right here it says, compressor start assist required for reciprocating compressors in the following, do, 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 right? Hard shot off expansion valve, liquid line solenoid, Low ambient cooling, long line. Required for single phase scroll compressors in the following applications. Long line, low ambient. So a scroll, it's okay to use it if you, uh, it's okay not to have one with a hard shut off TXV. Otherwise we'd have to have one on like every single unit we do. But if it falls into the long line category, we are supposed to be putting a factory hard start kit on it. Do you see why I wanted Tyler to be in this class? Mm -hmm. And I'm not joking, like I, we should be doing this. We should be. It's not. It's not like oh well, it doesn't really matter. No, it, it, we should be doing it, right? It's not that big of a deal to have to do it. You just order the right kit, and when the install goes out, <laughs> the installers install the hard start kit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for laughing. <laughs> Sorry for laughing. Ronnie will go back and rewire it later, <laughs> and, put the new, and, and put the new compressor in. So we're not going to go any further through the guide. You get the point, though, that all of this exists within the guides. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory if you're just paying attention to it. Up on the screen here for you guys to reference, we've got it, but I wanted to give, so, so come on up here. We're gonna first install the crankcase heater. I want you to go ahead and take a look at that. So this is our, this is our crankcase heater. We call this a belly band crankcase heater. Why do you think they call it that? Because it looks <laughs> like the belly bands we wear? Because it looks like a belly band, yeah. You know, all of us wear a belly band. We're going to install this around the compressor. Now you're going to notice here, if we look at the if we look at the guide, it says for this kit, because this kit is kit number 1401. That's the one that's designed for this unit. It says route crankcase heater wires from the control box and attached to quick connect line voltage terminals 11 and 21 on the contactor. Reinstall the control. That's the wiring part. Very simple. Now. You're going to notice it doesn't say use a line thermostat or a compressor thermostat or any kind of thermostat, which means that this needs to still shut off somehow. So how is it going to shut off? I'm going to give this to Ronnie. See if you can find the CCH in this wiring diagram. <laughs> what are you talking about? Sam's doing the thing he always does. It's without fail. <laughs> yep. 20, 11 and 21 right here. That's the contactor. It's going to contactor and something else. That's not it. It's not CHS. No, it's, sorry, it's just CH. 11 yeah. and 21. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's right here. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Now, they don't give us a thermostat for this. This shows an optional thermostat, and it even shows the crankcase heater as being optional. But in this case, they give us a crankcase heater. This is the kit. There's no thermostat in it. And initially, when I saw that, I'm like, well, they're supposed to send one. But then you pay attention. Some of them here say that it does need a, um, a temperature switch, and then some don't. This kit doesn't have a temperature switch. So what shuts it on and off? Contact. Contactor. Contactor. So I'm going to let you wire it, and then we're going to talk about um, how it actually works. So go ahead and gather around. I want a couple of you. I'm actually going to get out of the way. I want a couple of you here in the front and then some on the back. Yeah, we would want to, we would want to make sure of that. Yep, all of our breakers are off. You know, normally we would test and all that jazz, but you know, whatever. Let's go ahead and, yeah, let's go ahead and take the entire fan out so that way we're not damaging it. All right, so one thing that I want to note quickly on the crankcase heater, and I don't know if it says it here or not, the, the connector on the crankcase heater, the place that you actually make the connection, 
you want to place that over the seam on the compressor. So if you're mounting that around the base and there is a seam anywhere on the compressor, right here. you don't want the heater element portion to be on the seam. You want the place that you tighten, the band, to be around the seam. Does that make sense? Like that. So it's all the way because otherwise that heater is going to be in contact with the seam, it's going to be more likely to burn up, and it's also not going to make good connection with the compressor body. Wrong. It's going to be very hard to see. <laughs> Why is that wrong? wrong. No, I'm just, and I'm, <laughs> no, it can't go over the seam. The seam's right here. Yeah, no, don't, don't listen to him. He's being difficult on purpose. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> uh, do you want to get some uh, spade connectors for us from over there? Because I think we're going to need those. You're doing that right. Drill sack. Yeah. Those don't already have spades on them, do they? Yeah, they do. Oh, they do. Never mind. Does it have to be tight tight on the compressor? It needs to be tight tight, yeah. Are we going to test it? No, but we're going to leave it on there. I mean, I mean, we're going to leave it on there. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, so you should, I mean, in real life, you would test it, absolutely. You would make sure that when you energize a power to the unit and, oh, actually, we will test it. Why, why wouldn't we test it? Let's test it. Yeah. That'd be great. We're going to test it. The one at the bottom or the middle? Does it matter? Probably the bottom. What is he saying? Uh, the very the bottom heater? of the compressor. Yeah, you want it at the bottom of the compressor, yeah. That's the uh, coldest point. Well, it's where the it's where the oil would be. Which well, you don't need to heat the oil. You're trying to heat the, the case. You're trying to heat the oil. No, the case. You're trying it's to heat called the oil. a crankcase heater. Okay, come uh, you on. Know what? I'm not going to sit here and argue with you about come it. Come on. Where's our seam at? Right side. here. So, yeah. So our seam, we want to have lined up with the uh, with the actual connection point, and that's it. Did you, did you scrape yourself up there a little yeah, bit on the coil? Right. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Copeland in their specs actually talks about that. It's not in this guide, but in the Copeland specs, it talks about that. All right, so we're good. We can go ahead and put our top back on. And then we are going to power up only the condenser. And we're going to see how this works because uh, when we get a close up in this, you're going to see it. It's a little, it's a little odd. It's a little strange. would have made the mistake of not paying attention and connecting them both to the top because you would think that's how you generally power things up. But in this case, we want the crankcase here to be energized when? When the unit's off. When the unit is off. Now we don't have a temperature sensor, so it's automatically gonna come on when it's off all the time. If we had a temperature sensor, that would keep it off, or a, a thermostat, that would keep it off um, for longer, even after it cycled off based on temperature. But he wired it up in such a way that when the contactor is open, there will be potential across these two points. Okay, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. This crankcase Do we have the 240? It needs 240. It needs, it needs 240 volts, right? Yeah. So we're going to get the display here. Do we have the condenser breaker on? No, nope, but I can turn that on whenever you're All right, ready. Not the air handler, only the condenser. Do we All know right. which is which? Uh, uh, 25. The higher one. Yep. You ready? Yep. Go ahead. Are you ready? Yep. All right, so we notice the thermostat doesn't light up, so we only have power here. We're just going to confirm at the bottom. Sure enough, because this is a uh, commercial building, we have 208, so that's why we're seeing 212. Up here, we're going to have nothing. I mean, next to nothing, because our contactor is not pulled in. But why would we have potential in between 11 and 21? And as you can see, we do. We have 212 volts there. Why would we have 212 volts across an open contact? Because again, we're relying on this to energize our crankcase heater when the compressor is off. We don't want it to be on when the compressor is on. Are you going to say anything? Is anybody going to actually Sam's say saying. anything useful? Go ahead, Sam. Because it's traveling through the motors. It's traveling through the motors. And the reason is, is because it is what we call a plus one single pole. So we have this other pole here that's constantly intact. So potential from this leg is able to go through and travel through our motors. And then it makes it back to the other side. So we're actually seeing the voltage that we see here. And we'll go ahead and just show it to ground, even though this wouldn't be a normal test. You see, we have 122 volts there. The reason that we're seeing that is because it's back feeding through, uh, through all those loads. So I've got 120 volts here on one leg, 120 volts here on the other leg, and then we have 240 across. So it's being fed through the motor windings as well. 
And if we take our amp clamp, this would be our final test to see is our crankcase heater working. Very low. Mm -hmm. 0.12 amps, but that's all that you expect in this case. It's not a really hot heater. It's just enough because it's sitting there all the time. The whole time it's off, it's drawing a little bit of current, and that's um, keeping that compressor crankcase warm. That's it. Now, as soon as we energize, and we're going to, I'll go ahead and do it um, just by pushing it in. But I want you to, here, just hold this here so you can see it and the camera can see it. As soon as we energize it, now there is no potential across this any longer because now electrically those two points become the same. Zero. So when it's running, it's not heating the compressor. When it's not running, it is heating the compressor. Yep. And that wiring configuration of wiring it across the contacts, top to bottom, that allows that. If we wired it any other way, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't function in that way. That kind of makes sense a little bit, sort of, kind of? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you can get there just by following the instructions. If you just follow the instructions, it'll do it. But if you're, if you're not paying attention, a lot of techs would put, it, put these two wires on top. And if I put this wire, rather than having it here, if I put it over here, when would the crank AC to run? When it's when operating. The when the unit's on, which is when you don't need it to run. And when it's off, it wouldn't run. Right? So that would be silly. If we, what, what happened if we put them both on the bottom? It'd be constantly running. It'd be run all the time, whether it was running or not running. That would also be bad. Right? Wouldn't be the end of the world. It wouldn't be that bad. But, but it, it would be bad. Extra energy, extra heat. Yep. Mm -hmm. cool. it, it, it eventually just burns itself out, wouldn't it? I mean, it's not meant to run that. Yeah, I, I think it's meant to, meant to be on while the compressor's running, so it would probably burn out the crankcase heater, yeah. I don't. I, mean, I haven't tested it, but... That would have worked in a two-pole contactor? It wouldn't work on a two-pole contactor, exactly. If you put a two-pole contactor, if we replace this with a two-pole now, it wouldn't work anymore. we got to do a jumper. You'd have to do a make jumper. A one, yep, one you'd make it a one pull. Yep. So it comes with two primary components. What are the two components? Yeah, I might just the relay, the relay and the capacitor. And the capacitor. Now I want you to look here at what we have on the uh, on the screen. You can see that even just for this family of hard start kits, look at all the different start relays and start capacitors that you could potentially have, and the combinations of them. This is the reason why universal hard start kits by their very nature, not because of anything that the manufacturers of them do wrong. I'm not throwing shade on the manufacturers of them, but by their very nature, they're not as effective as factory ones because factory ones, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Look, 145 to 174 microfarad, 270 to 324, 80 to 108, 270, 325, you know, a bunch of different kinds, a bunch of different uh, types of start relays as well. So they actually show where you can mount these, uh, the actual slots that are already designed for this. find funny if you start to look carefully at these things there's always like significant typos this is this is the run contactor <laughs> that's uh that's good like, no like, such thing like, as, a, <laughs> as a run contactor but this is how i mean this is essentially the configuration that we're going to use here for this five two one can she run five goes to terminal 21 that's black this is five this is terminal two terminal two goes to our yes it's going to yeah, herm on the, the yeah relay. okay all right so that's our blue and then one goes is our is our brown and that goes to our start capacitor either side and then the other side of our start capacitor is yellow which goes to the c side terminal 23 or the c side of our run capacitor in order for the start capacitor's capacitance to be added in parallel with the run capacitors this switch closes and um, and it's added together. But it's the potential difference between terminal two and terminal five, that's where the actual relay coil is. And so this, and this setup, because it's a three wire setup, um, it's the difference between our common side 
and our uh, start side, the difference in potential there, um, that starts off with the switch closed, but when that difference in potential increases to the point that that, um, that, that contact opens, then it brings or takes out the uh, start capacitor altogether. And what causes it to increase is, is the rotation of the motor. Counter electromotive force, back EMF, yeah. So you know it's going to drop out once the motor starts yep. spinning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you can see, I was extremely uh, patchy in describing that because it's actually been a really long time since I put in one of these, mm -hmm. you know? So there you have it. Cool. So how, how would you test it? That's one question that people ask. Um, you could test it by actually measuring your uh, start amps with the capacitor in and without it in uh, either on common and if you did it on common then it would actually show lower start amps not because the start amps actually are lower but because the amount of time is lower and so your meter will show it as lower um, or you could actually do it on your start winding going to your compressor so in this case our start winding is this one right here so if we measured our current on our start winding itself with the hard start kit in it would draw higher in rush current on our start winding. And with our start capacitor out, it would draw lower. Now again, you'd have to put it on the in rush setting on your meter in order for that to function. Or you could, if you're just wondering if it works at all, you can measure it here and it would tell you if you, your capacitor is empty or the relays. Oh uh, uh, yeah, true, open. true, true. Yep, you could just do it there. Good point. That would be a, another good way of doing it. Cool, all right, so Sam, I want you to talk through this liquid line solenoid that I handed you. Well, the liquid line, well, so mm -hmm. we have our solenoid here. Mm -hmm. It's called a liquid line solenoid because mm -hmm. it is installed in the liquid line. On the liquid line. Yep. Um, yep. 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 And it's basically designed to close on no call for cooling, which will prevent back liquid coming to our condensing unit. Hence the <laughs> hence the liquid line shutoff valve. How do we wire it, Sam? Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't know, but if I were to guess on how I would want to no, wire this. No, no, you this, should you should know. <laughs> I would say um, it would be a um, it would be a close on open, which means that our Y call is going to go to this and whenever we lose our Y call, the valve will close. That's how I would do it. Okay, how, let's explain that again. So, um, what type of what type of valve is that? So, does it is that valve closed when it's energized, or open when it's energized? It would be uh, closed when it's energized. Closed when it's energized. So, if you wired that between common and Y, and if it's closed when it's energized, how, what would happen? Okay, we're getting closed as in closed as an open refrigerant. Yeah, correct. That, so, that's the only possible meaning because it only well, it doesn't if, have if a switch. If you were to say it's it. closed when it's energized, it could be shut off when it's energized, which is the opposite of what we want it to do. On a we wouldn't valve. want it to shut off when it's energized. Correct. We would want it to open when it's energized. So that would mean it's a normally yeah. closed yeah. valve. <laughs> Sounds about right. All right. Yeah. It's a normally closed valve normally closed that opens on energy, when energized, energy. right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the that's the configuration. And if you look at how the wiring diagram says it needs to be wired on the screen, take a look. How is it wired? One side goes to common, other side goes to Y, and see that what it says down at the bottom of that valve? What does it say? Normally closed. NC, normally closed. normally closed. So it's a normally closed valve, and you wire it in between C and Y. That's pretty much it. The only other thing is the direction that you point the valve. So let's look at this real quick. Hmm? Heat pump application, heating enhancement, or heat pump long line application. Let's read what it says. Cut the liquid line within two feet of the outdoor unit, depending on application. Place three eighths inch flare nuts on cut ends of liquid line and flare both ends. Remove and discard solenoid end caps, then connect flare nuts to the solenoid valve assembly. Here's the part that we're getting at. Solenoid valve must be mounted with the coil above the valve body. Arrow on the valve must point towards the outdoor unit. The arrow on the valve must point towards the outdoor unit. Why does the arrow on the valve point towards the outdoor unit? Because that's the direction of the flow that we're trying to cut off. So we're just going to try to stop. Mm -hmm. Because we're doing it in heating mode, right? So that's the only time we care about it. That's what it's designed for. It's a heat pump long line application. Okay, it only matters in heat pumps that don't have hard shutoff TXVs in heat mode, right? That's what we're that's what we're trying to prevent. 
So it actually will allow flow back the other direction, but it will not allow flow so in it's a that direction. Valve. It's a one-way valve. Yeah. That's it's why closed, it has an arrow. It allows it the other way. That's 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 my understanding. I don't. It doesn't just close all the way. Why would you need it on the white call then? Why wouldn't you do it on the yellow call? Where's the arrow on this thing? How come I don't see an arrow? Where's the arrow? It's on the top. It says no. No, it's not. You're lying. You're doing that thing you always do. He's getting back. Right here. Like I, 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 I grabbed this thing fully expecting to see an arrow, and I don't right see an arrow. That's not an arrow. Yes, it is. Look really closely. That's not an arrow. It's an arrow. Oh yeah, look at that. It's an arrow. If it's not an arrow, it's inappropriate. What? Which direction is this arrow pointing? Okay, we have the base, uh -huh. and then this flat, and then the. I, I need you. To, I need you to look at this with me, everyone, because I am not seeing an arrow here. You think it's pointing that direction? Yeah. That looks like a shovel. Yep. That's supposed to be an arrow? I agree. If we mark it out. It does look like a shovel. Mm-hmm. Well, As you can you see now. You ever try to use a shovel back? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's like a guy's head. That's not... Shovel. No. Right, because we're going we ahead. The shovel but... facing towards the outdoor unit. Anyway, <laughs> the arrow is supposed to point to the outdoor unit. I really don't think that that's a appropriate arrow. But uh, anyway, you get the point. That's how it should be installed. So it should be installed at the condenser, two feet away from the condenser, not at the air handler. And that's all. Yeah, sure. Least likely thing that we're going to actually install, but that is, uh, those are the standard long line application accessories. That was this class. I think the first part was a lot better than the second part, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hands on is always best. Uh, you, know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind, hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing, you can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.